greet you one and all in the name of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ this morning. I am indeed grateful to be with you here today. I've enjoyed the service so far, and uh, it's been a blessing to be in on your Sunday school and to hear the discussion out of Romans 8. It was going on there. There's uh, a lot to be discussed there. There is no condemnation for them that are in Christ Jesus. What a promise to claim for the believer. This morning, I almost don't know how to title this, what I'm going to speak about, what I feel like I should be speaking about. But maybe I'll just give two words. Beholding God. Beholding God. If you would open your Bibles to Exodus chapter 14. And I'd like to point out something that happened in the lives of the Israelites. And that point brings to bear the first issue that I want to talk about. We heard this morning of the family that has the young son who has had cancer, or is they've discovered the the growth, that they've had the surgery. We heard this morning of our brethren in Haiti and what they are suffering and what is happening there. Things are totally out of control. Likely every one of us in some time in our life, we have come to a place where something like that has happened to us and things are totally out of our hands. And that's the first point that I want to speak about today, beholding God when things are impossible. Beholding God when things are impossible. We have it here in Exodus chapter 14. Let's just begin reading in verse 1 of chapter 14. And the Lord spake unto Moses, saying, Speak unto the children of Israel, that they turn and encamp before Pihirath, between Migdal and the sea, over against Beelzebub, before it shall be, it shall ye encamp by the sea. For Pharaoh will say of the children of Israel, they are entangled in the land. The wilderness has shut them in. And I will harden Pharaoh's heart that he shall be honored that he shall follow after them, and I will be honored upon Pharaoh and upon all his hosts, that the Egyptians may know that I am the Lord, and they did so. Now, I'm sure God could have taken Israel out of Egypt by another way, by another path. In fact, the Scriptures in chapter 13 says that God didn't take them out by way of the Philistines because he did not want Israel to have war right away as they walked out of Egypt. They weren't used to war. And so God was in mercy saying, I'm not going to take them out that route. But now he takes them out by a route that would look like it's an impossible way to go. He brings them right up to the Red Sea. There are no boats. There's no ferry. There's no bridge. On the one side, there is a pagan temple that is guarded. On the other side, on the other, in the other direction, and there's mountains on both sides if I understand the terrain, there is a fortress, impenetrable, basically. And so Israel is fenced about on three sides, the only open spot is back where they had just come from. And Pharaoh is having regrets for having turned them loose. And so he has the world's best army, and he gathers them together, and he says, we're going to go after them. We're going to bring them back. And Israel, like sitting ducks, right there in that spot. God of the impossible. In the life of probably every believer, 
there comes a time when we get that feel that we're fenced in, we're boxed in, and there's no place to go. What is our default response at a time like that when panic tends to hit and be the natural response? What do we do in a setting like that? What did Israel do? Oh, they murmured. They, they told Moses, what? It looked like terribly poor planning. After all, what, what were you thinking? And God says, I think Moses tells Israel, stand still and see the salvation of the Lord. It is in times when there seems to be no way out that God would really like for us to just throw ourselves onto him and let him be God. That's what he did in this situation here. They turned, Moses turned to God, and God said, stand still and say the salvation of the Lord. And that night, the wind blew. It says the sea, the wind blew and made a dry path in one night across the sea. Moses, his rod had gone out and the path was opened up and they were now to cross, but during the night there was the blowing of the, of the, the, the wind and it dried the path. And the angel of God made his move, went from front of Israel to the back of Israel, was a light for Israel and darkness and a cloud to the Egyptians. World-class army behind them. And Israel begins to go through the sea. And it says there was a wall on the right hand and on the left. And they passed through the sea on dry ground. Not muddy, dry ground. That would mean that in that night they had to take all their flocks across, their cattle, everything that they were taking with them had to go with them that night. It was no small feat for them to pass through that sea in one night. And the Bible tells us that as the Egyptians decided, okay, we're going to follow, Israel went out with a high hand and the Egyptians decided, okay, so they think they're getting away from us. We're just going to follow them. But the Bible says something began to happen. If we have it, let, let me just see if I can pick it up here. Um, yeah, in chapter, in verse 25. And took off their chariot wheels. Whoa. Well, let's just read and it came to pass that in the morning watch the Lord looked upon the host of the Egyptians through the pillar of the fire and of the cloud and troubled the host of the Egyptians and took off their chariot wheels that they drave them heavily. So the Egyptians said, let us flee from the face of Israel for the Lord fighteth for them against the Egyptians. I will be honored upon Pharaoh, God said. I don't know how we should pray about what is happening in Haiti that I've just heard just now, this morning, announced to us. Should we be praying that God would somehow wipe out the, the gangs? How should we pray when we don't know how to pray? But I think the thing that is important is that we call upon God and we allow him to do what he considers to be best in regards to his kingdom. When things seem impossible, the test of our faith, and what are we going to do as we are facing those things in our life? It is so important that we learn to simply cast our care upon Jesus and leave it right 
there. That's not easy. I just remember at the time when my wife was going through her journey with the cancer, how difficult that was. And as day by day we were journeying, walking through the path of would it be recovery or would it not be recovery? God chose to give recovery as best we know. And we are very grateful for that. But we did not know that at that time. And I just remember how that felt like such an impossible situation. And yet God was there and showed himself real and gave us answer one answer at a time. Uh, what way shall we turn in this? And I remember that our children were a part of that process as we had questions. What's the next move? I just remember, especially our oldest daughter and our youngest son was still at home at that time. And as we discussed some of those things, and I, I asked, just laid out the options, and I, I remember my son just said, well, Dad, you know, you can't afford this option. We, we don't have that kind of money. Isn't that an answer? That was a shock. I needed that challenge. You know, we, we'd like to take every, every route that we can possibly take. But one of the routes, he just pointed out, you can't afford that. We can't afford that. He was right. And, but that gave clarity to the situation. And, and so it gave us another a, a diversion on a place to turn to. I believe that God uses the limitations that we have as a way of answering, possibly, and pointing us in the right way. And that was definitely an eye-opener for me when Javon, our youngest son, just pointed out, well, you can't afford that. That's not something you should be th even thinking about, because how are you going to pay for it? We couldn't. And so that was an answer for us, and it helped us to turn in a different direction. When things are seemingly impossible. So when things are impossible, what is the step that you and I need to take? There's no question that at point we don't have another option available to us. We don't know of another option. So what do we do at that point? I think it is there that God would want us to simply ask him to take over. In fact, we should always do that. When we simply submit ourselves to God for his plan and his purposes to be done, the death of an individual and of a Christian is not a tragedy, but it is a well-planned route that God has we shall all die. It is appointed unto man once to die, and after this, the judgment. So the death of, an, of a Christian is not a tragedy, but it is something that is in the plan of God. And God uses death of his saints to move on and to move forward his own kingdom. It happened over and over again as the apostles in their journey after Jesus had given them that commission, go and teach, they went and they taught. By the time the apostle John, who was the oldest, died of a natural death, they had tried to kill him a number of ways, but they couldn't do it. By the time he died of a natural death, the whole known world at that point had received the knowledge of Jesus Christ. And there are those today that think that Jesus in Matthew chapter 24, when he spoke about the whole world, must first be, must first know, and that we today are waiting until the whole world knows before Jesus can return. That would mean there is no evidence in the return of Christ. I believe that scripture was fulfilled before the death of the 12 apostles. The whole known world had been contacted and knew about Jesus coming, and that there was a Savior. They were busy, but it meant they gave their lives. 
They gave their lives. And I'm sure that there were many things that they would have rather done than give their lives. My friends, today, when things seem impossible, God has a plan and he has a purpose. We must remember that in the book of Daniel, when he speaks about the the four kingdoms of the world, the kingdom of Babylon, the kingdom of the Medes and the Persians, the kingdom of of Greece, uh, Alexander the Great, and the following kingdom of Rome, And then you have that stone that is hewn out of the mountain and it tumbles. That's the fifth kingdom. How long does that kingdom last? It tells us that that kingdom lasts until the end of time. To the end of time. The kingdom of God, as God, as Jesus introduced it in the book, it comes through the Gospels, uh, Matthew talks about it as the kingdom of heaven. The rest of the apostles talk about it as the kingdom of God. It's a kingdom that started at the birth of the church and is going to be going on. It's the kingdom that's going to conquer till the end of time. But in that time, in the lives of the believers, there are things that happen, and in the world, there are things that happen that absolutely look impossible. What must it be like for one who is a Christian who lives in Ukraine or in Russia today? Those countries who are at, at, at war against each other, or we could say in Israel or in Gaza. Where there is a conflict and there's war, the bullets are flying, and you never know what's going to happen or when. What must it be like for those people who live there? We do well to pray for them, that God would protect them, that God would help them to be faithful, God would provide for them. We shouldn't be taking sides. A Christian in Russia is just as precious as a Christian in the Ukraine. A Christian in Gaza is just as precious as a Christian in Israel and just as precious as a Christian in the United States. When things seem impossible, seeing God when things seem impossible. Israel walked through the Red Sea because God made a way when there was no way. He will still do that today. In the lives of the believer, we throw ourselves and cast ourselves totally into his hands. He will make away for his people. God's glory, secondly, through creation. In the hands of creation, as we look at creation, God shows his glory around us, and I believe that God puts that there for us to observe when we're tired, when we need renewal. We need to look at creation. Psalm 19 Just a beautiful passage there. The heavens declare the glory of God. The firmament showeth his handiwork. Day unto day utter speech. Night unto night showeth knowledge. There's no speech, no language where their voice is not heard. Revelation chapter 8, we have the trumpets. Or is it chapter 7? We have the first four trumpets. And those four trumpets, they speak of judgment or of activity among in the skies in the seas, in the rivers, and on the earth. The continual blowing of the trumpet, I think we're seeing it today, the increased blowing of the trumpet, when we have all the disasters of the world today. And it's interesting to note that an unbelieving world many times, while they may profess not to believe in God, but when there are things like a tornado, or like a hurricane that comes along, or an earthquake, or whatever. At that point, who do they blame? They want to blame God, who they don't believe in. How does that work? It doesn't work. My friends, what is it? God speaks through the voices of nature. 
He does. And it's important for us as believers to take, take a drink of the glory of God by recognizing that God speaks through nature. God has nature in his fist. He can do what he wants to do. We have the example in the book of Matthew where the disciples were out on the waters. Matthew chapter 8, it tells us the story how they were out there on the sea and the, stor the storm came up. Jesus was sleeping. He wasn't worried about the storm. But the disciples were and they woke him up. Don't you care that we perish? And Jesus says, Our, don't you have any faith? And he calls the water to storm to cease, and it ceases. And they say, oh, what manner of man is this that even the winds and does that still happen today? I'll tell you it does. There was a day in the life of us pastors in Kenya when we wanted, we needed, we felt like we needed a day off. It was probably foolish for us to do this. But we all decided, most of us, there was most of the pastors at that time, we got on the boat and the question was, do you want to take a boat with a motor or do you want to go sailboat? Oh, this would be the kicks. Let's go sail. So we got on this boat. And in Kenya, you can't go on a half-loaded boat. We didn't realize this. We, had, we thought we had enough for a load. But uh, they made sure there were about well, maybe four or five, six people all extra on there yet so that this uh, boat was down, setting deep in the water. And I probably had a little bit of uh, room left, I guess, because the boat wasn't quite down on the edge of the water. The water wasn't quite coming in yet, but it was heavy. It was, I mean, this boat, and um, he had told us, you know, this time of year, you put the sail up, we're going to be out, we're going to go out to Ndeti Island. Said, if you put the sail up this time of year, you'll probably, we'll probably be out there in a couple hours. Shouldn't be, shouldn't take too long. Well, got on the boat, and the, the sail went up, and uh, uh yeah, there's a little wind. Not much. Now the boat began to move, and uh, it moved a little bit. And all morning long, we piddled out toward that. Finally, we got to that idol, and it was probably 2 o'clock. We got onto the island. Now, by that time, we were, you know, we're, after all, we got the U.S. mentality, and we do our things by time. Figuring this out, we, we got to get back. The wind was blowing us out. How is this going to work? Well, well, okay. So we didn't stay on the island very long. That's why we went out to be on the island. We, hadn't, we weren't on there very long because we all had this in mind. We got to get back. So we got back down on our boat, and we got the boat moved off. Oh, and to beat it all, the, the pilot of the boat, the man who was in charge, He'd forgotten to bring his oars except for one. He had only one oar. So we couldn't help much. Now the afternoon was, and the sun was, this equator sun right over us, and the sea looked like glass. That's pretty, right? It's pretty when you don't need a wind to push you. It was pretty. But we had a problem. The boat wasn't going anywhere. So sail was a joke. There was nothing. We sat there. We sat there. But there were these, oh, these were pastors, right? Pastors in the boat. What do pastors in a boat do? Well, I know one pastor that prayed. And we watched that happen. <laughs> Here comes the wind, and the sail was no more limp. The boat began to move, and it moved faster, and it moved faster, and it moved faster. And it's good to see the water outside the boat, but when it comes over the side and into the boat, it's a different story. God was answering our prayer for wind and to move us. But now, ah, it was almost dark. 
The water was coming over the side of the boat. As I said, we didn't have much. We actually, when it was, <laughs> when it was so quiet and we only had one, ro one oar, we were actually taking our hands to make, to make ourselves go. But now all of a sudden, we were moving. And the water was coming over the side and we didn't have much to bail water out. But guess what we did again? We prayed. And as the wind had come, it slows down, and the waves go back down. And late that night, we reached our destination where we had begun in the morning. Does God still move the seas? Absolutely. Absolutely. We saw it that day. The pilot of the boat, who was an African, who was a good friend of ours, he didn't hear us pray. We heard that he was worried. He didn't know what was going to happen when that wind came up. They pulled that sail down. They folded it smaller and smaller and smaller, and finally there was just a small piece there, and we were still zipping across the waves. But God stopped it. Does God work through nature? To Absolutely he does. He's never lost control of it at any point in any time. But that day, I became aware of God's glory in a different way, dealing with nature. Dealing with nature. Thirdly, God's glory in building the church. God's glory in building the church. In Acts chapter 7, we have something happened in the New Testament church at the very beginning of the church that I'm sure was a tremendous shock to the early church. Jesus said in Matthew chapter 16, I will build my church and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. But in Acts chapter 7, there was Stephen, that bull preacher, and he was put to death. He was stoned to death by the very Jews that should have been glad to hear his message because he brought them the message of Jesus Christ. But they hated him because of it. They gnashed on him as their teeth and they killed him. And the question, I'm sure, of the early church at that point is, God, what do you have in mind? Is this the way it's going to be? We have no idea how many people despaired of the church and left because of the death of Stephen. We don't know that. But what, what does God do when things like that are going on? What is God doing? Well, we know what he was doing there because we can look back on it. Acts chapter 9, Paul, who was a witness at the death of Stephen, he's going to Damascus to arrest believers. He's a persecutor. And as he's on his way to arrest, there's a light that shines down from heaven and Paul falls down to the earth. And who art thou, Lord? Lord. I am Jesus whom thou persecutest. It is hard for thee to kick against the pricks. What were the pricks? The prick of Stephen dying with a testimony. I see Jesus at the right hand of God. That was the prick, I believe. That's what it took. For Paul to begin, yes, he continued on being a persecutor, but the prick was there. Something was pricking. Something isn't right. And so when he was down there on the earth and he knew that something supernatural was happening, Lord, what wilt thou have me to do? You go into the city and it shall be told to you what you shall do. Ananias gets the dream and says, gets the word from God. There's a man over here who needs your help. He, that? Uh, he's here to kill us. 
And God says, I want you to go heal that man's eyes and bring the sight back to his eyes because I've called him. He's going to be the apostle to the Gentiles. God was building his church. Does he still do it that way today? Well, let me give you a story of what happened in Kenya. I believe he still does such things today. It was in the year of 2002. It was on a Sunday afternoon. My wife and I were on the whole way, way home. I was uh, leading out at the church at Nakuru, even as well as at Kisumu at that point. We were on the way home from the church at uh, someone tell me. <laughs> Not in, yeah, at Nakuru. We were on our way home back to Kisumu, two hours trip, drive, when we got a phone call from one of the church brethren, one of the com compound missionary, and said, I've got bad news for you. There has been a, an issue. Four of our young people from, and our son Gene, who is here this morning, could tell you the story very well. He was a driver of the vehicle that morning, and there were three. Our youngest son, Javon, was along, and two more of the mission boys were along. And they were making a complimentary visit to one of the church brothers who was at, the, at a university just outside of Kisumu, about 20 minutes, 25 minutes up through there, where the university was. They were making a visit to encourage him there. And as they were on their way up through there, there was a public service vehicle that pulled off to the side of the road. And a young boy, maybe 12, 13, got off of that vehicle, crossed the road right in front of the vehicle that our young brethren were driving. Bounced right off of that bumper into eternity. Monday morning, there was someone at the gate who wanted to talk to me. But I went out there. It was the uncle of the young boy who had been killed. The uncle was the guardian of the boy. The father of the boy was also lost. I don't know all the issues. There was some kind of taboo in the marriage. There was a cross-tribal marriage. The father was a Colin Jean, I think. The mother was a Luel or a Luya, I'm not sure which. And so there was some kind of taboo with this young boy, and that's why the uncle was the guardian. The uncle was also the village drunk. And he had come to the gate to ask if we would be, if we would do the funeral. Now in Kenya culture, if there's an issue that is festering. The place where you get and settle the score and get even is at the point of the wedding, of the funeral. That's where you settle the scores. So I was in a rock, but sort of between a rock and a hard place. If we do this funeral, that's very likely where they're going to now. This is where they're, this is their chance to get even with us. But as I contemplated what would God want us to do, I told him on the spot, yes, we'll do the funeral. And I remember when I told our church brethren, our national brethren, I remember their responses. You, really? I said, yes, I feel like this is the thing we ought to do. We need to go there to show that we bear no ill will. Obviously, it was an accident. We were not planning anything like that to happen. 
And I remember going to the hospital and taking the casket there, and we picked up the body of the boy, and the relatives had gathered there, and we'd, so we gathered the relatives and the casket, and we headed up into the area where the funeral was to be the next day. And as we got out there, this is another very unusual, they usually bury it right around their houses, and usually they have the grave site right beside one of the houses, but this was not to be. Instead of bringing the body into the uh, dala, the, the compound that they have, they took the body, I wanted me to take the body out in the middle of a field. And they carried a small table out there in the middle of the field and put the casket on top of that. And that was very, I knew enough about the culture to know that that is very unusual. There's something, something going on here. But our church brother said, you, you sure you want to go up there? And I said, we need to do this. And you know, the blessing was, they said, well, if you're going, we're going to. I think there were three van loads of church brethren that went with us up there for the funeral the next day. But as we brought the body out and they put the casket out there in the middle of the, uh, in the, in the field, it was like, like a movie, watching a movie. I began to see the children coming, rows of children. They came and they came and they came and they came and they came walking down there and surrounded that casket. It seemed like the whole school where this young boy had been attending was coming. They surrounded that casket, and the first time and only time I ever heard that song, they sang, Carry Me Home, I think they, is what was, was the gist of the song. Beautiful song. And I was amazed. I've sensed no tension. I was just amazed. And the question was, well, what is God doing here? The next day, we went up there. And it was probably the largest funeral that I'd ever preached in Kenya. There were hundreds of people there that day for that funeral. And we preached a salvation message as clearly as we could. We sensed absolutely no tension. We had furnished the expenses for the entire funeral and everything, including a large meal afterwards. And they did it the African way. They served the people. It was just a tremendous time together. And one of the headmasters of the school came to me later and he said, you know what happened today? The community is saying, you have lifted the curse from our community. You see, just weeks before that, a bus had come through there and hit someone and killed them and kept on going. And they felt there was a curse on that community. And they said, by you coming here today and speaking to us and preaching the word here, you have lifted the, this curse from this community. The village drunk, Doreen, was saved sometime after that. Changed man. We didn't have a local church. We didn't have a church in that area. But he wanted a church like that. And so he would travel all the way to Kasumu, a long way, for a bike. He didn't have a vehicle. It was expensive to go public, and he couldn't afford that. So he'd either walk or he'd bike down to Kisumu and then park his uh, bike in our compound and ride from there to the closest church. He became a very faithful member at that church. In fact, he was our volunteer. If you needed somebody to do something at the church, oh, he, yep, he'll do it. Coming from all that distance, what a challenge. He became a firebrand in our church. And do you know what? Sad to say, Jorim didn't stay faithful. But do you know what? Our son, Javon, is over there today. And you know where his church is? Right there in that area. God builds his church. 
in ways we wouldn't plan. Through the death of Stephen, God brought brought about the conversion of Paul, who would take the gospel to the Gentile world. Through the death of that young boy, God brought the gospel into the new community over in Kenya. And there's a Christian Believers Fellowship Church, AMA Church, right there in that community. Pretty much in sight of where the boy was killed. God's glory. God's kingdom. God's glory in death. Let me close with this story. The last enemy that shall be destroyed is death. It was in May 2022. I'd walked with my brother Ivan through his cancer journey, tried to go visit him basically every Saturday and sit with him for a spell. But on this Saturday morning, and I did not think that death was closed for Ivan, this Saturday morning I got a, a call, phone call from one of his sons, and he said, we're calling the family together, and Ivan said they should call me. Without that special invitation, I would have felt like an intruder. So I went up there to Ivan's house thinking that I would spend the day there being with Ivan and the family. But as I walked across the porch, I could hear the groans of pain. My prayer changed from God heal him to God take him. I walked into the bedroom. His wife Elsie, sitting at the side, his daughter in law, a nurse, monitoring his health, his vitals, and etc., and his son, Dwayne, sitting on the bed. And I got there, and I sensed the situation, and uh, I hardly knew what to say. I told, if I remember right, I took Ivan's hand and said, sat on the bed, took Ivan's hand and said, Ivan, I'm here. And we asked, can we read Psalm 23? And he nodded. I began to read the psalm. The Lord is my shepherd. I shall not want. <clears throat> he maketh me to lie down in green pastures. He leadeth me beside the still waters. We came to that passage. Something changed. It's like God was answering a prayer. <laughs> Ivan's visage changed from one of pain to relaxing. And we continued through the psalm, but the transition had begun. Shortly afterwards, all of a sudden, Ivan began to like sit up. And as he began to sit up, Dwayne on one side and his Daughter-in-law on the other side, they sort of, what we did not realize, looking back, we sensed that Ivan was seeing something. Something we could not see. 
He lays back and just fades away. The last words that I said to him were, I am the resurrection and the life. He that believeth in me shall never die. I haven't, I'm not saying goodbye. I'm saying, I'll see you on the other side. And I haven't passed away. Before all the boys could get there, he was gone. That was glory. When a saint dies, it's not a tragedy, friends. God calls them home. I look back at that and I say, that was a tremendous privilege to have been able to be there at the side of my brother at the time of his passing. I couldn't walk across that river with him. But there was no storm. There was one who did walk with him. And today, the last enemy that shall be destroyed is death. But my friends, you and I do not need to be afraid, afraid of death. Death is but a gateway. Yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil, for thou art with me. I'm going to close the service. Do we pray? Please. Let's pray. Thank you, God, today for your kindness and compassion. And Lord, we thank you so much today that we can behold you and see you in all of life's complexities. And as we walk through life, I pray that you would have give us the grace to see even in nature, to see in the impossible, and to see in the work of the church and that which happens in our lives today, that we would see your hand and we would behold you through it all. Help us to have that grace and the ability to see beyond the temporal and see and understand your purposes. In the name of Christ, we ask it. Amen. Turn the time, please.